I mean, sometimes you you, get, you go to mass, you just look at you know the communion kind of queue, and you, you realise that for whatever reason, and I mean, it is always difficult to to judge. Though that doesn't mean that we don't do it. Um, uh, you know why people are, are kind of acting in a certain way, or or maybe not not being as reverent as as we could be. Um, so, you know, I suppose one question is um, those those numbers. I mean, you know. They sound they sound about right to you, and and if if so, um, you know why do we think that that's the case? And and you know are these sort of statistics are they kind of useful to us? What can we do with them? Yeah, I mean the real kind of uh, central plank of, of the introduction to this is that the British numbers look better. Okay, right, and which is sort of surprising, but in, in another well, sense. yeah, because mm. America is a much more religious place generally, yeah. and depending on where you are, that can be very evident or but there's bits of America that yeah. you know where that's not evident at all but generally speaking um, yeah now again yeah we won't get into the, the the methodological details about how you ask questions and phrasing and things like that but certainly on the face of it I mean the British numbers were not great like yeah. don't get me wrong <laughs> yeah. right but they were they looked better which is always you know always good um, the really interesting thing that comes out of the British numbers is that the younger ones are more kind of orthodoxly believing than than older Catholics. And actually, this is critical because there's two things going on here. Um, well, two or three, but I think the, the two big ones is one, precisely what we said before, at that age, at that level of kind of secularized world that they've grown up with, a high proportion of, of their peers will no longer even tick a box. Right? So there's a sense in which the... That inflates the numbers because all it, it all the, the the weaker and more kind of culturally uh, attached people we don't even have those anymore. Now that's not a good thing, right? The yeah. fact that you know you've lost that that people baptized Catholic or whose parents were baptized Catholics are so distant that they no longer even tick a box, right? That's there's not a lot of kind of spinning that as a good thing. No. However, other than what we're about to do, which is to say that the knock-on effect, the side effect of that is that the precisely what we've just said, the ones who are left have to be more committed. Mm. And, and, and in a sense, that's what you want. You want people who are there for a reason, um, who know what they believe, um, and, and who kind of hang out with others and get married to them and, you know, and, or, or, you know just have that kind of supportive network of, of peers um, who also believe very weird countercultural things as far as the, you know, the wider culture is concerned. Um, so I think essentially what we're probably seeing in the British data is that we're getting to a point where kind of secularization is, is going to bottom out, right? You, you can't, can't go on forever, right? Um, we've had 50, 60 years of it. You get to a certain point when things... The people who are left are there for a reason, and that's precisely the kind of group where you might see growth again. Plus, immigration helps a lot. Because, I mean, those numbers that, that you know one, one would read sort of in fifty years' time, if if current trends continue, there will be no Catholics left. That that, that doesn't work like Nonsense. that. That's, okay. Yeah, um, big, it does. Present trends never continue, right? Okay. Present yeah. trends just don't continue for for huge long periods. Um, there was a study that got quite a lot of attention in the press uh, last year, I think. Um, which was a, quite an, a very interesting way of modelling different denominations' growth and decline. But that's where that kind of, by 2063, the last Catholic. That, that, for a start, it doesn't take into account immigration. The Catholic Church in this country has, for the past 200 years, been constantly topped up by immigration. Now, that's cheating in a sense. Like, okay, yeah. that, that's, that's true. We're reaping where we did yeah, not Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but... Uh, well, to be fair, we did so. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. They've come back to us, or at least Ireland did. Oh, yeah, us, right? in Africa as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is an element of that. Um, but um, the the other thing about that is that you you get to the point where the people who are left have to be there for and have to be more tenacious, and and you know will. Again, you, if you meet young, if you go to East 2000 or something, or, you know, any of these kind of young groups, uh, you even Tutum or uh, New... I mean, I don't even know what the groups are because I'm too old, right? Uh, <laughs> but you're going to find, you know, bright young professionals who are committed to the faith, who 
are probably having more kids earlier than their peers and are trying to form their kids in a very difficult situation in a much more intentional way. And actually that, that will start to have a slow, gradual kind of bounce back. And, and it won't suddenly bounce back to where it was. You know, that's just not going to happen. And so much has changed. But we're beginning to see this. And I think if this isn't just a Catholic thing. You know, if you go to, um, you know, an evangelical church in the middle of London, Holy Trinity Brompton, for example, it's the same. Very, it looks very different. But it's the same kind of inner dynamics as you'll see at the Brompton Oratory next door. Right. You've got it's a very weird thing to be an evangelical or a practicing Catholic. Right. Yeah. Um, but the a big city like London has plenty of them, and if they gather together and congregate and are sufficiently committed, then they start to attract others. I mean, is is this the sort of vision that um, Pope Benedict um, laid out? I think well, it must have been already in the sort of sixties, late fifties. Yeah. yeah. So of of a, a, a smaller church that, in a sense, couldn't depend on its. Um, kind of cultural capital and even institutional yeah. capital of the past, and you know that meant, uh, to a certain extent, losing some of the maybe the buildings, yep. the institutions, but having a kind of rump of people who um, were kind of fully committed. I mean, I, I see that in my own children. You know, they've taken this kind of very countercultural decision to practice in their faith, and so for them, it's like, well, if we're going to do that, we're not going to do that just. For um, we we might as well go the whole hog, uh, you know. We might as well um, believe in the weirder things, and and they they are they're, they're way more interested in, you know, scapulars and and uh, miracles and things that than I ever was, um, because they've kind of embraced the whole of it. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I think that's exactly that's exactly what we're seeing. So that you know, and if you reread those early essays um, from the fifties and late sixties as well, there's there's two very famous ones that often get quoted. Um, you know, he talks about, you know, there'll be a, a time when, you know, Christians can no longer afford to inhabit the structures built in better times. Well, how many churches are we selling or, mm. or, or need selling? I mean, it's, it's that precisely that kind of. And it's, uh, it's, it's a side effect of sexualization. It's a byproduct. It's not like sexualization isn't happening because, look, there's some young committed Christians. It's they're the side effect of secularization and, and the, what happens after secularization. And it's also true, and you see this, and it's kind of those kind of, uh, you certainly see this with, with younger clergy, um, but younger, um, you know, I see this at St. Mary's, you know, if you go to mass, um, you know, girls, young women rather, you know, wearing mantillas, you know, or, or people rediscovering the rosary, stuff that like is hardly, ra- you know, like radical stuff mm. for their grub great grandmother's generation now kind of kneeling for communion yeah exactly all that kind of stuff but is seen and is embraced as this well if we're going to be catholic we're going to be properly catholic right what does that mean and there's a brilliant uh doctoral thesis by another former student of mine who's now a colleague at um st mary's um susan longhurst who did a doctorate interviewing people who were joining the catholic church who going through the rcia in in a particular year in southwark and she found with them like they all, you know, they were obviously making a really kind of a weird culturally thing to, you know, go to the effort to become Catholic. And they wanted to be Catholic. And she, she says that every single one of them she interviewed mentioned the rosary, even if she didn't ask. And she got to the final interview and thought, oh, there's one who hasn't mentioned the rosary. And then they're like, oh, one more thing. Um, and it, it's things like that. Things that in the past were seen as kind of distractions and extras and accretions and things that distracted you from the 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 mass which was the whole point we get rid of the devotions so people can focus more fully yeah. but actually it was sociologically anthropologically naive because actually that's the scaffolding